Welcome to Lessons for Living. My name is Bill Santos. Thank you so much for joining me. It was almost unthinkable. Players throwing the World Series. Yet that's exactly what happened. Or maybe it didn't happen in the fall of 1919. The players on Charles Comiskey's 1919 Chicago White Sox were an irritable lot. The club was divided into two gangs of players, each with practically nothing to say to the other. Together, they formed maybe the best team in baseball ever. Yet, like all ball players of the time, they were paid only a fraction of what they were worth. Because of something called the reserve clause, any player who refused to accept a contract was prohibited from playing baseball on any other professional team. The White Sox owner paid two of his greatest stars, outfielder Shoeless Joe Jackson and third baseman Buck Weaver, only $6,000 a year. Kaminsky's decision to save expenses by reducing the number of times the uniforms were laundered gave rise to the original meaning of the black socks. Kaminsky has been labeled the tyrant and tightwad whose stingy practices made his players especially willing to sell their baseball souls for money. But in fact, he was probably no worse than most owners. In fact, Chicago White Sox had the highest team payroll in 1919. In the era of the reserve clause, gamblers could find players on lots of teams looking for extra cash. And they did. The 1919 World Series resulted in the most famous scandal in baseball history. Eight players from the Chicago White Sox, later called the Black Sox, were accused of throwing the series against the Cincinnati Reds. Details of the scandal and to the extent to which each man was involved have always been unclear. It was, however, front page news across the United States, and despite being acquitted of criminal charges, the players were banned from professional baseball for life. Included in that group of disgraced ball players was the great shoeless Joe Jackson. The controversy surrounding the 1919 World Series is most confusing in regards to shoeless Joe. The facts indicate that Jackson had no involvement with the fix other than being aware that it was going on. In 1919, known for his natural abilities on the field and his extraordinary home runs, Jackson was well on his way to becoming a baseball legend. Today, however, he is remembered for his association with the Black Sox. Jackson played in that World Series and always pointed to his record as proof that he played to win. The real conspirators made intentional errors to lose the games. Their records show a combination of poor hitting, numerous fielding errors, and second-rate pitching. Jackson's performance, however, in contrast, was blemish-free. He made more hits than any player on either team. He scored five runs and drove in six. His batting average was 375, and his 12 hits set a World Series record in the field. 30 balls came to Jackson, he made no errors. Legend has it that as Jackson was walking through a parking lot after testifying to a grand jury on his involvement in the scandal, the legend says a small boy came up to Jackson and said, say it ain't so, Joe. Jackson was quoted as replying, it's so, kid, it's so. Shoeless Joe was 33 when his professional baseball career abruptly ended. Many attempts have been made to have Jackson inducted into the Baseball Hall of Fame in Cooperstown, New York, and all attempts until now have been denied. During his grand jury testimony, White Sox pitcher Eddie Chicote, a teammate of Jackson's, made the following comment. I don't know why I did it. The wife and the kids don't know about this. I don't know what they'll think. I've lived a thousand years in the last 12 months. I would not have done that thing for a million dollars. Now I've lost everything. Job, reputation, everything. I don't know why I did it. That can be an all too familiar refrain for many. 
all of a sudden, before you know it, you're caught in this web of sin with no apparent recourse for breaking free. You know, the Bible says in Romans chapter 3 and in verse 23, the following. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. All of us have made mistakes. All of us have sinned. But Jesus Christ, in his endless love for a fallen humanity, came and died to set us free from the bondage of sin into a life of happiness because we know that our sins are forgiven. While we were yet sinners, the Bible says, Christ died for us. Now, if the Bible had been written by an image consulting firm, I suspect that many of the stories that we find in the Bible would not have been included. But God wanted us to have a pattern for living that we could relate to. The stories in the Bible had to be relevant and speak to each of us where we currently are. Well, one such story is taken from the life of David. Like we've spent the last few programs studying the life of David and pulling from his example some practical lessons for our living. Well, this particular event in David's life is probably one of the most dark episodes, if not the darkest episode, in David's roller coaster existence. It makes us want to cringe and almost cry out, Say it ain't so, David. I believe this experience is included in the Bible to warn us of the destructive power of sin, even in those who love the Lord. So David is 50 years old. He's been king for about 20 years. He has fused Israel into a solid, powerful nation. He had set himself apart as a mighty warrior, a talented musician, and a visionary man of God. Yet, David is faced with the unrelenting pounding of temptation and the sea wall of his life is about to give. Although David had been following the cultural standard of his day for monarchs of accumulating wives and concubines, he was nonetheless violating God's standard. No one, however, confronted David about his sin. Maybe people felt that as long as his leadership was causing the economy to expand and the nation remained strong and healthy, well, what difference did he make if he had a few indiscretions in his personal life? After all, his personal life is his business. But these seemingly harmless indiscretions were laying some wicked roots in David's heart. Flattery and the subtle allurements of luxury and power were not without their influence on David. Crimes that would not be tolerated in the subjects would go completely unmentioned when they were committed by the ruler. The monarch was under no obligation to restrain himself as were his subjects. And this caused David to begin to lose sense of his own sinfulness. Rather than draw closer to Jehovah in humility, he began to trust his own wisdom and might. Now, never are we more vulnerable to the temptations of pride and self-indulgence than when we have strayed from God. And David was no exception. Before the conclusion of the war with the Ammonites, David left the command of the army to Joab and returned to his palace in Jerusalem. The Syrians had already surrendered to Israel, and the complete overthrow of the Ammonites was imminent. Well, maybe David felt that after 20 years of plodding through battlefields, he deserved some rest. His army was well-trained. They were in the hands of a competent commander. Back in Jerusalem, David was surrounded by the fruits of victory and the honors of his wise and able rule, and rather than doing like most kings and fighting alongside his men, he decided that he would delight in the pleasures of his success. It was now, while he was at ease and unguarded, that Satan seized the opportunity to occupy his mind. The fact that God had brought David into so close a relationship and had done so much for him should have been, you would think, a strong incentive for David to preserve his character unblemished. 
We begin our story today in 2 Samuel chapter 11, beginning at verse 2. Now when evening came, David arose from his bed and walked around on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful in appearance. The woman bathing catches David's eye, and he stops to look, and he continues looking. He loses all awareness of who he is and the danger that now lies ahead. David forgot everything, his family, his kingdom, and even his God. Verse 3, So David sent and inquired about the woman, and one said, Is this not Bathsheba? the daughter of Iliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite. David is so numbed by his lust that his servant's warning that Bathsheba is married to one of David's elite warriors has no impact on David whatsoever. But within a short time, the woman is standing there before the king. Verse 4. And David sent messengers and took her, and when she came to him, he lay with her. The affair is a short one, probably best described as a fling or a one-night stand. So what's the big deal? Well, David has violated God's law. And as God's appointed leader for the nation, the one who was called upon to uphold God's law, David should have known better. David abused his power. He took advantage of the privilege that God had given him and he betrayed the trust that his people, his family, and his God had placed in him. Now, I don't think Bathsheba should be left off the hook completely. She probably needs to bear some of the blame. Um, she could have called out for help or maybe done something. But nonetheless, David was the king. He was God's chosen king and he had the obligation to uphold God's law. The story continues in verse 5. And the woman conceived, and she sent and told David and said, I am pregnant. Well, now the consequences of David's act are starting to hit home. Now the reality of what happened begins to set in. But instead of facing his sin and coming before God in repentance and humility, for the first time in his life, David tries to sweep his sin under the rug. You see, Bathsheba was the wife of Uriah the Hittite, one of David's bravest and most faithful officers. What would happen if word of David's affair was to get out? God's law prescribed the death penalty for the adulterer. And what might Uriah do? After all, he had been wronged. He might want to avenge himself by taking the life of the king or by inciting a revolt. Something had to be done. Verse 6. Then David said to Job, send me Uriah the Hittite. So Job sent Uriah to David. When Uriah came to him, David asked concerning the welfare of Joab and the people and the state of the war. Then David said to Uriah, go down to your house and wash your feet. And Uriah went out of his king's house and a present from the king was sent after him. It does not take a rocket scientist to see what David's plan is here. He's not really interested in how the war is progressing. He's simply concerned about getting Uriah home to his wife. But the king underestimated this warrior's strength of character. Rather than going home to his wife, this soldier sleeps alongside David's servants at the door to the palace. When asked by the king why, he replies in verse 11, the ark in Israel and Judah are staying in temporary shelters and my Lord Job and the servants of my Lord are camping in the open field. Shall I then go to my house and eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? By your life and the life of your soul, I will not do this thing. Well, the commander in chief is taught a lesson in integrity by one of his soldiers. Uriah is completely dedicated to his country, to his king, and to his Lord. David makes one last attempt to get Uriah to go home to his wife. David decides he will get Uriah drunk, but even in a drunken state, he shows more self-control than David. He refuses to go home. 
So what was David to do? Every attempt to conceal what he had done proved unavailing. David had betrayed himself into the power of Satan. The situation around him was a dangerous one. He was facing a dishonor more vicious than death. There appeared but one way to get out of this predicament. And in his desperation, he was about to add murder to adultery. By Uriah's own hand, David sends Joab a message to put Uriah on the front line of battle and abandon him there where he will surely die. This time, the plot works. Uriah is killed. Along with him, other soldiers. Verse 24. Moreover, the archers shot at your servants from the wall. So some of the king's servants are dead, and your servant Uriah the Hittite is also dead. Well, if the adultery alone was not difficult enough to cover up, now David not only has the adultery, but the innocent blood of a soldier on his hands. Job sent word that Uriah had been killed in battle with some soldiers. David offers a deceitful reassurance, verse 25. Then David said to the messenger, Thus you shall say to Joab, Do not let this thing displease you, for the sword devours one as well as another. Make your battle against the city stronger and overthrow it, and so encourage him. Now David now moves to the final phase of his plot, verse 26. Now when the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah, her husband, was dead, she mourned for her husband. When the time of mourning was over, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife. Then she bore him a son. Bathsheba observed the customary days of mourning for her husband, and at their close, David sent and brought her to his house, and she became his wife. The same David whose conscience would not permit him even when his life was in peril, to put forth his hand against Saul, the Lord's anointed. The same David had so fallen that he could wrong and murder one of his most faithful and most valiant soldiers and hoped to enjoy the undisturbed reward of his sin. David must have sighed in relief, thinking that he had gotten away with murder, literally. But God sees things differently. Verse 27. But the thing that David had done was evil in the sight of the Lord. With that sobering statement of God's justice, this dark episode in David's life comes to an ominous end. The fact that a godly man like David would succumb to such ungodly desires gives us much to ponder. Emma Johnson writing for Forbes after hackers exposed email addresses and names of some 37 million Ashley Madison clients said, the numbers are compelling. An estimated 20 million men were active members of a fair seeking site, Ashley Madison. I crunched the numbers and estimate that about one in six married men in the United States were on the site. You know six married men, I know at least six married men. At least one in six of them was on Ashley Madison. A a CBC report the other day said this, Sao Paulo, Brazil, the largest city in the Western Hemisphere, tops the list of world cities with 375,000 Ashley Madison accounts. Next come New York, Sydney, then Toronto with 223,000 accounts. Calgary is in the top 20 at number 17 with 107,000 accounts. Among the 10 Canadian cities with the most Ashley Madison accounts, London, Ontario leads when measured by the share of the city's population with 10.5%. Toronto has 8.6%, which compares to Sao Paulo at 3.1%. At 6.3%, Canada tops the list of countries ranked by the share of the population with Ashley Madison accounts. The U.S. has a 5.1%, Australia 4.6%. According to DataViz, 66% of the email addresses in the data dump were valid and 34% invalid. Now keep that in mind 
when looking at findings by email domain name. DataViz found these numbers of email addresses attached to Ashley Madison accounts. 228 Government of Ontario emails, 170 Department of National Defense emails, 77 City of Toronto emails, 40 Parliament emails, 10 Senate emails. The Canadian press reports there are hundreds more from other departments and agencies, including Justice, Public Works, the Canadian Revenue Agency, and the RCMP. <laughs> what do you say to that? Very, very sad. Here are a few practical things that can help us avoid these destructive situations in our lives. Number one, establish boundaries that keep you out of compromising situation. Do not put yourself into situations where you are likely to be tempted. You know, Martin Luther King Jr. would say, you can't keep a bird from flying overhead, but you can keep them from nesting in your hair. Number two, do things with your spouse. Make time for yourselves, away from the kids and the chores, and enjoy each other's company. Number three, have a friend, someone you trust. Have them hold you to standards. Maybe your church has a men's ministry or a woman's ministry. Join other husbands, other wives that are looking to strengthen their marriages also. Number four, do as the Bible suggests in Philippians 4, 8. Finally, brethren, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is of good repute, if there is any excellence, if anything worthy of praise, let your mind dwell on these things. Be conscious of what you're feeding your mind. We become what we behold. Be selective in the movies you watch, the books you read, the places you frequent. Number five, most importantly, cling to God in daily dependence. Take hold of God's hand, never let go, regardless of how Satan might try to tempt you. Make your communion with God the first and the most important activity of your day. No matter what other obligations try to snatch this precious time away, make it a priority to pray and to study your Bible. You know, if someone had told David when he was a boy that he would one day commit adultery, father an illegitimate child, and murder an innocent man, David would have exclaimed, never. Yet it happened. We are never too old to sin. As long as our flesh is alive, we have the potential of committing the worst sins. Join me now as we pray that God may protect us against all moral failure. Let's pray. Father in heaven, we thank you for the guidance you provide for our lives through your holy word in the examples of men like David. May each viewer today submit their lives entirely to you. Help us to make time to pray and to study your word. Help us to resist Satan's temptations and forgive us where we have failed. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, we've come to the end of another program. Thank you again for spending this half hour with us. Um, let me remind you again of the website, l4ltv.com. On the website, you can find a Bible study group or a church close to you. These are folks we have scoured the country and found these places that will be the best for you to get grounded in God's Word. They are all over the country. There are some wonderful locations here in the GTA, in all over Calgary, my friend Pastor Lee and Pastor Ali and friends in Edmonton. Just go to the website, l4ltv.com. Put in your address, it'll show you the group. If there's no group close to you, contact us. Email me, bill at l4ltv.com, and we will set up a Bible study with you online. 
we will do that because we believe this book contains the answers to life's most perplexing questions. And we want you to learn what is contained in here. I attend the Harmony Adventist Church in Toronto. If you ever want to come out, 89 Centre Avenue. The address is on the website also. We're there every Saturday at 10 o'clock for Bible study and 11.30 for worship. So visit the website. Like our Facebook page. And if you want to follow me on Twitter, at Santos underscore Bill. Well, I think that is all I have for this week. I hope you're enjoying this series in the life of David and you're pulling from it some very practical lessons for your living. Oh, I hope to do this again real soon. God bless. We'll be back in touch very soon.